Welcome back everybody to our materials informatics playlist. Today we're going to dive into one of the coolest topics of them all, neural networks. We've already talked about linear models, nonlinear models, SVMs, random force, ensemble techniques, right? Those are all great, but arguably the most powerful of all are the family of neural networks, right? These things can do incredible things. Uh, just take this for example, right? If you remember our video previously where we talked about features, we said that features really matter, but they matter much more so in the limit of small amounts of data. If you only got a hundred or a thousand data points, adding these custom composition-based feature vectors, whether that's based off of Olianic or Matavec or whatever, right? These help you much more than random, but by the time you get to a large amount of data, they kind of stop helping. That's because if you just give it enough examples and in your model it has enough tunable parameters, it can learn what to pay attention to without you having to tell it that these are the important features. Well, that's kind of the idea behind uh, deep learning. Deep learning and neural networks, once you're at about 1,000 to 10,000 data points in that range, once you're to that point, your model is able to learn the appropriate features on its own. Your model no longer needs to be told what features to pay attention to, which makes it really powerful because finding those features and figuring them out can be really hard. Okay, so. Obviously, if you've heard people talk about neural networks, if you were like me, you at first thought like, wait, we're teaching computers, They're, we're making them work like our brain, like a biological system. Well, that's kind of what the name came from, but they are certainly not the same as biological systems. If you take like a brain, sure enough, yes, it's made up of neurons and they pass messages to other neurons. And in a neural network, you have nodes which receive information and pass information forward. So. I mean, it's not like there's no similarities, but there's a lot of differences as well. Let's just so note some of these major differences. This comes from a really good article on um, towardsdatascience.com. They point out that the size, obviously, of the brain and a typical neural network is very different in terms of total number of nodes. You've got 86 billion in your brain, but there's only between maybe 10 and 1,000 in an average neural network. The topology is also very different. Not all neurons are fully connected to everything else in like one layer to the other, right? But that's typically what happens in our, in our neural networks uh, in, in machine learning. Each layer is typically fully connected to the next layer, right? So th that's a big difference. The speed is different. Computers are way faster at sending information from node to node. Your neurons actually can only fire a signal and they have to wait a while before they can fire again, right? There's also a difference in fault tolerance. In an artificial system, we have no redundant information. Each one of these connections from one node to the other via a certain connection is potentially unique information. But in a brain, you have a bunch of these neurons that sort of, they wire together. In fact, the old saying, neurons that wire together, fire together, right? There's redundant information in case one dies or doesn't work or something. Um, that's, not the, that's not the case for us. Power consumption, check this out. Your brain runs at about 20 watts. If you look at the total energy per time being consumed to run your brain on average is significantly lower, right? 10 times plus lower than uh, some of the current graphics cards that are out there, which run at 250 watts or so, right? So big difference in the power consumption. The signal is another important one. A neuron either fires or it doesn't. So it's one or zero. But in a neural network, we can pass forward information in between. You can send zero, you can send one, or anything in between, right? It gives lots of intermediate values, which gives us a, a very big difference in how information gets passed. And then the learning is also different. In your brain, you're learning all the time. It's more like reinforcement learning. You're constantly you know, evolving how these connections work to, to learn over time. This is why you learn how to walk, and later on you learn how to talk, and later on you learn how to speak another language, right? You can do this over time, but in our case, we do most of our learning up front, right? It's at a, it's in a predefined model, essentially, okay? So obviously there's probably more differences you could think of, but just to dispel the notion that this is an artificial brain, it's one that has some similarities to a human brain, right? So that said, neural networks come in many, many flavors. This is not all of them. There's, there's more complicated diagrams than this. Here's one that I found. It's showing you all the many different types of architectures that you can have that are all considered neural networks because they're all about nodes that pass information to something and away from something, right? So all sorts of different ones. And we will unfortunately not cover all of these in this video series. Instead, we're gonna talk big picture. In this video today, we're gonna talk about the so-called vanilla uh, neural network or the multi-layer perceptron, right? So we'll talk about that in this video. And then in our subsequent videos, we'll be talking about some of the variations. We'll talk about convolutional neural networks, um, recurrent neural networks, transformers, which are sort of something else entirely. So more on that to come.
but just realize that it's a broad field. You can take a whole class, right, just on deep learning and not cover everything probably. All right, so let's dive into uh, what makes up a neural network. What is actually going on here in a vanilla so-called neural network, right? Well, you have nodes. And a nodes are formed in layers, right? So in this layer, we have you know x number of nodes there, and then in the next layer, you might have a different number of nodes. It might be the same, it might be a different number, and you can have as many of these layers as you want with as many of nodes as you want within each layer. And then in the end, you're gonna have some sort of output. It could be a single value, like maybe you're predicting a material property like strength, like a single value. Maybe you're predicting a classification, so it will end with like 10 values. Maybe you're like predicting one of 10 categories, like classifying it as rock salt versus spinel versus, you know, whatever, right? Um, it depends. It's flexible in the architecture. Um, so what are these things? And obviously, and then you have connections between these layers. So the nodes are simply a place to store numbers. A node is just a holder. It's a placeholder for a number between 0 and 1, okay? They are also functions in that... What, if you've got something here, they can pass information forward to the next layer. So they're a function that receives something, does something with it, and passes information forward, okay? Uh, so, and then you've got these connections, right? So the trick is like, you know, when you use this sort of neural network which is made up of lots of nodes in a layer and as many layers as you need, sometimes people think like, oh, maybe you're trying to classify a crystal structure or predict a property, right? If you're trying to predict a property like uh, conductivity, well, some people early on thought like, oh, maybe these different layers are the things that must be present for your prediction. Like for it to be a metal, you need to know something about electron uh, shell overlap. And you then you need to know something about like density or something like that. So initially there was some thought that these different layers were sort of encapsulating those high level interpretable concepts. Um, that's not the case. Bummer, unfortunately, that's not the case with neural networks. Um, they're much more abstract than that. In our next video, we'll talk about convolutional neural networks where there's something much more akin to what people wanted, that each layer builds up some sort of hierarchical understanding until you get to your final property prediction. It's much more like that with convolutional neural networks, but that's not really the case here with our vanilla multi-layer you know, perceptron. Okay, So let's dive into a very simple version of a neural network and talk about how the information gets passed and, and some of the things going on. First off, a little bit of notation. A sub J superscript L. J stands for which node we're talking about. Like there's two nodes, the one in the zero position and the one position. We use Python notation here typically. And then L stands for this layer over here. All over here, since we're not in the same layer of L, this would be the L minus one layer if this is the L layer. And now we have a different, right? It's still a subscript for which node, but it can go from zero, one, or two, okay? So that's the notation for the activations. Activations are like the value stored in the node, okay? That's your activation. And then we need a different notation for the lines connecting these nodes. For example, this line connecting the node at AK, L minus one, to the node at AJ, at L, we would call that WJK, because it's going to J from K, right? L, because it's ending at the final layer. It would only come from this previous layer. Uh, some neural networks allow you to jump layers, but we're going to not talk about those for right now. Right? So that's the notation that's used to describe the points themselves, these nodes, their activation values. And this W stands for weight. Right? When you pass information from one node to the other, you multiply it by a weight. And a weight is a tunable parameter. This is what allows you to actually fit this to your data, is you can adjust this weight such that your model then makes a better prediction. In fact, since these are fully connected networks and every one of, like this node is receiving information from here and from there, right? We actually have to sum up the input from all of these ones that it's connected to. So the value at A01, right? That's this point over here. This is A01. It's the zeroth node in the number one layer, right? It would be equal to sigma, which we'll talk about in a moment. And then you're gonna do the W00 weight, that's the, the weight going from node zero to node zero, times the activation energy of, the, the activation of the, whatever information was stored here, this would be the A0 L minus one layer, right? So zero, 
you're going to add that together with the next layer and the next layer and the next layer until you add them up, all of them. And then you add to it an offset, what we call a bias, right? So this gives us a bunch of tunable parameters. We have three different weights for these different lines connecting to here and one bias. So there's a bias for every one of these nodes. There's one bias. And there are weights for every single one of these connections, right? So all of a sudden, we end up with tunable parameters, our weights and our biases, right? So the last thing we haven't talked about is this sigma thing. The sigma thing is just a function that squishes the outcome back to a number between 0 and 1. Because imagine if you added these up. What if you had like 10 nodes or something? Well, if you took every one of the activation values, which is the number between 0 and 1, and you multiply it by some weight, which is some number, right? And you add all those up, maybe you end up with a number that's much bigger than between 0 and 1, or maybe much smaller, right? You need to squish it back into a value between 0 and 1. And so there's different what we call activation functions for doing that. And we'll show you a few of them that are popular. But this is the kind of idea and the nomenclature that we use. Obviously, we can generalize this to any suitable size, right? If you all of a sudden realize that you could have as many of these layers as you want and as many nodes as you want, well, we could represent all of those weights and all of those biases and all of those activation values in a matrix. And we could actually say, oh, so if these are the activation values for your first layer, and we want to figure out what the activation values are for your next layer, then you need to know all the different weights, right, for connecting all those different nodes together and know what all the different biases are. If you take this multiplication of these two matrices together, right, this dot product, and then add to it these biases, you can figure out any arbitrary value of your activation function on the next layer, right? What's powerful about this is that this is all now just linear algebra, right? By representing things as matrices, we can do the math much, much faster. Um, there's actually hardware that's been custom designed to do calculations on linear algebra sort of expressions. So this allows us to do these calculations really, really quickly because if you go back to our sort of first drawing, look at all these weights. And this isn't even a complicated model. Some deep learning gets more complicated. Like as you add layers, we call this getting deeper and deeper in learning, right? This is more deep learning. So all of a sudden, there's a lot of tunable parameters. We need to be able to do our math really quickly as we pass information through these things, OK? So um, one thing that we should figure out is which activation function to use. We said as you combine these things together, we use the sigma function to squish it back between 0 and 1. Well, what function do you use? In the early days, they used this sigmoid or logistic one, which basically it was this curvy line that said, you know, it, it's 0 for negative values or values close to 0. And as you get larger, it approaches a value of 1 as x gets much greater than 0, right? That's kind of the idea here. So that, and it worked, but it's not great. They actually found out that they could do better. They could do a better job of turning off features by having a function that was 0 and then thresholded. So what is very common is this ReLU function. ReLU stands for Rectified Linear Unit, where again, take a look at it. If you pass it a negative value, then the, the, the value stored at the node is just 0. Not a small number, but 0. It actually kills that node. It says nothing important is here. Okay, But then if you pass it a value that's positive, it scales with it. It's linearly scaling with it, right? So this has become a really, it's a better learner. It learns faster than a sigmoid, but it's not the only one. There's leaky ReLUs where it's now like a slight negative, you know, the slope changes basically below zero. There's a bunch of other ones. Like there's many different uh, activation functions to choose from. And these can be thought of sort of as hyperparameters. Just like there was hyperparameters like the depth of your random forest tree, these are hyperparameters for your neural net that you could figure out which activation function does the best. But in general, ReLU is a really good one, okay? So how does a neural network learn, right? It's clear how these things get connected, but how does that actually learn patterns in your data? Well, you start by randomly initializing all of your weights and all of your biases. Remember, those are the two things, the only two things that we can tune in our model. The data is what it is. The output is what it is. You calculate the difference between the output and what you expected it to be, like the true value, and you have some difference. If you want to minimize that difference, the only thing that you can do is update your weights and your biases, right? This matrix over here representing all of your weights, meaning all your connections for a given layer, and all the biases for all of your nodes in that layer, those are the things that can be updated, right? So how do you do that? 
The way we do that is by introducing a cost function. When we make a prediction, we ask what it predicted and we compare that to what the value should have been. We take a distance and you add those up and average them across all of your samples. If you've got a thousand data points, right? You run it for all, you know, however many you want to run, right? And then you average it across them and you say, looks like we have our, our average score here. We should now update our model to minimize that score, right? That distance, that cost. So the big question is, how do you do that? And so here's where I warn you that back propagation is how you do that. And it's coming. <laughs> In a couple slides, we'll get there. But let me first introduce like the main idea of how back propagation, at least conceptually, works before we dive into the math. Okay? Conceptually, we know that we need a function there that allows us to calculate a gradient. If you've heard me watch any of these videos, you've heard me talk about gradients already. It, a gradient is actually the way to maximize a function. So the negative gradient is the way, the fastest way to minimize a function. Like if you're this ball on this hill, do you step to the left or to the right to go down? Well, clearly you see in this picture, we need to step to the right. Well, how big of a step do you make? Something that's clever is that, you know, depending on where you're at, you can, if you have a gradient, then you know which way to step and we can actually make the step size proportional to the gradient so that you can take a big step at first, but as you get closer to the bottom of this hill, the gradient is decreasing. Well, we can make our step size decrease as well so you don't overshoot it. So that would be really cool. But all of this depends on us being able to calculate the gradient. To figure out the gradient of a function, you must have a function, first off, and it must be something that you can take the derivative of. If you can take the derivative of something, it's a function, and then you can calculate the gradient. And now we're in business. We could now start taking steps towards that minimization. So as we train it over and over, we're going to incrementally, step by step, nudge our W and B values towards the appropriate ones to minimize our loss function. That's kind of the idea. Uh, or think of it this way, right? Let's say you're doing just a binary classification. You're, you're predicting this is the output, right? You're saying metal or insulator, right? If something is supposed to be a metal, but it's not, that means that this node, the insulator node, let's just label it, right? This one is our metal node, and this one is our insulator node. If it's supposed to be a metal, but it's not, then you need to do two things. You need to decrease this node. Let's just write it on top of it. We need to decrease the insulator node, and we need to increase the metal node activation, right? If we can do that, then we will have made it made the correct prediction. So how do you increase this activation value? We said that we can't actually tune that, right? The only things we can tune are our weights and our biases. The activation, that's just a function of our weights and our biases and the activation function that we use, right? So if we can only change W and B, then think about it. If we want M to become larger, because we wanted to predict it as a metal when it wasn't predicting it as a metal, what can we do? Well, we can increase the bias, right? Making B larger would give us a larger M. Or we can increase the weight. Increasing either of those will cause the metal one to go up. So, or we can increase the activation from the previous layer, but the only way we do that is by connecting it, you know, and calculating its weights and biases from the previous layer, right? So the idea here is you go layer by layer. You start at the end, and we're going to work our way backwards, adjusting our Ws and our Bs to nudge these values up or down, depending on what we want them to do. And obviously, this is averaged across all of our samples. It's not just for a single sample. You run all your samples and get an average what you need it to do, and then you make your nudges one by one, layer by layer, working backwards. Kind of makes sense? I hope it kind of makes sense. If that kind of makes sense, I think we're getting ready to being able to explain the mathematics of back propagation. Um, maybe one last thing here, right? It moves from the end backwards. So for each step that you're getting a list of nudges that you want to happen to the previous layer. So you collect them for all your weights and biases in your whole network. You then generate this list of nudges for each and every sample in your training data, and you average it across all your training data. The average is the negative gradient of your cost function, or at least something that's proportional to it, right? Now, before we actually show you the mathematics, let me point out that you don't train on all of your data, right? And then it's not like you train it and then you're done training. Instead, you train it iteratively over time by sending it chunks of your data and you periodically ask how well the model's doing and you just keep on training it until you're done. This is different. This is different than what we did with like ensembling. Think of, remember ensembling where we did bootstrapping to create a small mini data set? 
And from that mini data set, we fed all of that to our decision tree. It trained it one time through, and then we had a decision tree that was trained. That's not what we do with neural networks. Instead, we break it up into what are called mini batches. The problem here is that if you trained uh, on all of your data, it would be too slow. There's all these weights and biases. It can be tens of thousands of them. Like there can be many, many free parameters to update and to change. So if you trained every single one of your data points, it would just go really slow. So instead, they do what's called stochastic gradient descent, where you train on a chunk of your data, not all of your data, some portion of it, called a mini batch, right? Um, and you compute a step based off of the gradient calculation. Like you calculate the gradient for that little chunk, you take a step along that direction, and then you move to your next mini batch, and you calculate the gradient again, you make another step. So each step happens with the mini batch, but not your entire data set. So you need something like a data loader to break your data up into smaller data chunks, and we'll show you that in our next video, right? But that's the idea, is that step by step, you're gonna take a chunk of your data and figure out what step, like what should I do to all of my W's and all my B's? Should I move them up or down to get closer to our target using gradient descent, right? Uh, and then what's cool and kind of not intuitive is that you actually train through your entire data set multiple times. You train through it once. Now you've gone through every single data point in your data set. Then you start back over and you start training through it again. In fact, there's a word for that. We call those an epoch, an epoch or an epoch, right? As you go through it, as you train it, take a look at this as an example from an actual paper we published. You look at the loss of your model, right? That's your cost function output. How good or how bad is your model? You want to minimize that loss, right? With the cost function. You can see that as we train it, it trains, it gets better and better and better and better as you train. We've, at this point, 1,000 epochs means we've gone through whatever our data size was, 50,000 data points. We've gone through each one of those data points a thousand times because we've done a thousand epochs. We went, we went all the way up to 1500, but take a look at here. If you look at the test set, which is really the validation set, not the actual test set. We did that only once at the very end, but the validation set, take a look at it here. It stops getting better after say 250 epochs, maybe 500 epochs, it's not getting better. So these so-called, these are called learning curves. These so-called learning curves are really powerful because they tell you when you can stop training your neural network. At some point, it's not getting any better. Like you're, you're memorizing your data because your training score is getting lower and lower and lower, but your validation score is not getting any better, so you can just stop. That's helpful because these things are slow to train, way slower, way, way, way slower than your classical models. And so knowing when to stop becomes important because you can spend weeks training a model or much longer even, right? So that's a powerful thing to know how to do that. Okay, we are finally ready to dive into backpropagation. Okay, backpropagation is kind of gnarly. Let's kind of break it down and make this as simple as we can. So. Um, to do that, we're gonna assume a very simple neural network. How about this one? <laughs> Four layers, one node each, right? Not a very realistic neural network, but it's good enough to uh, explain the concepts here, right? So we've got our final layer, AL, the activation value in, this final, in the one node that's present in this final layer, that's AL, okay? Well, if, this, if we want to make this be higher or lower because it's doing some sort of prediction that's off, by being either too high or too low, right? It's, it's wrong in some way. Let's say it's a regression. We're trying to predict strength and this is too high or it's too low. Well, if we want to lower it or make it higher, remember the only things that we can change, our only free parameters are these things right there. We can change our weights, weight one, weight two, weight three, bias one, bias two, and bias four, right? Um, it's supposed to be bias three, right? Those are the only things that we can change. So the next question is, okay, if we can change those, let's figure out expressions for how our cost function varies with these tunable parameters. Well, what determines the cost function? Clearly, it's gonna be the difference between these two things. If you know the target value and you have your activation value in your final layer, you take the difference between those and that gives you your cost function, C0, okay? So a minus y, we typically square it. That will give us our cost function. Well, similarly, the, the activation in our final layer, we've seen this already, is equal to some sigmoid, that's an activation function, multiplied by the sum of our weights in the previous layer, multiplied by the activation layer of that previous layer, plus some bias, right? So that's our function for a l. Okay, you, you with me so far? So w's and b's are the only things that we can change. So how are, we, how are we doing derivatives with this? Well, 
we know that changes happen sequentially, right? If you want to change this final A value and in doing so change your cost function, we can change W and we can change B, right? These are the two things that we can change. But as you change those, they set off a series of chain reactions, right? As you change W and B, you change Z. As you change Z, you change A. As you change A, you change your cost function. So let's break this up into a series of steps and take the partial derivative. We have to take a partial derivative to see how our cost function changes as you change W. As you change your weights, how does that impact your cost function? That's what we want to ask. Well, it's made up of this step right there, this step right there, and this step right there. If we know how those three steps come together, we can figure out our total cost function. So it's going to be equal to delta C, delta A, multiplied by delta A. How does the activation energy change with Z? And then how does Z change with W? Where remember, all that Z is, we're just calling Z the inside of this, act, whatever's inside this activation function, we're just calling that Z, right? So it's WA plus B, okay? So by taking our overall thing that we want to adjust, like changing the cost function by changing W, we break it up into these three partial derivatives. Um, we can see how this works. So for example, DC, DA, we go back here. Well, what was C as a function of A? It's right there. So if we take the derivative, we're just going to bring the 2 down in front as an approximation, right? It's going to be 2 times A minus Y, okay? That's our first derivative with respect to A, right? Partial derivative. What about A as a function of Z, right? So how does um, A change as a function of Z? Well, it's just whatever your sigmoid function is, right? Or your activation function is. So it's just going to be whatever this thing is, the derivative of your activation function. Okay, what about z as a function of w, right? How does this z value change as w? It's just equal to the activation at the previous layer. So it's going to be equal to a and the l minus 1. Okay, combining all of those together, right, and averaging across all values, we come to this expression, right? So here we're breaking it up into those three partial derivatives. Here we showed you what they were. We then combine those and we average it across all of our samples and all of a sudden, check it out! we have a function for how our cost function changes with respect to changes in our weights. Pretty cool. We can do the exact same thing for how our cost function changes with respect to our biases. And this time we're going to pay attention to how this changes and how that changes this and how that changes this. The exact same thing. You notice that the math is actually almost the exact same. This partial derivative is the same. This partial derivative is the same. This one's a little bit different. So our final thing is slightly different. But now we have a way to see how changes in our cost, well, in, in either our weights or our bias, will change our cost function. So we can calculate gradients, right? So we use all of those. We use DC, DW1, DC, DB1, all the way, like for every single weight and bias, we can calculate what these partial derivatives are. And that is our gradient. That's our gradient. Now that we've got a gradient, we can go ahead and use this gradient to systematically change each one of these W's and B's in that layer to make our cost function perform better. Woo, that's a lot, right? That's back propagation. That's, that's the idea behind it anyways, okay? So um, obviously what we did, it was for a really simple, weird neural network with just like four layers with one node in each layer. But this can be easily generalized to nodes of arbitrary layers. Let's say you have like n number of nodes, right? You can update the, sorry, uh, yeah, n number of nodes. So each node j out of n total number of nodes, you can update this exact same approach and it only changes a little bit. Like it's basically the exact same approach. You'll notice that now because there's multiple nodes, we had to have multiple node notation. You had to say it started at the second and it went to the first or the third or whatever. So we had to have j and k notation where we dropped those off previously. But the math is almost the exact same, right? Okay, now that we've talked about backpropagation, you at least kind of have an idea of how you're going to nudge your weights and your biases to move the right direction. We can say some more general things about neural networks. First off, training them can be really hard. <laughs> it can just be kind of a bugger. Tweaking neural nets, as this sort of image shows, this joke shows, can be hard. There's a lot of things to mess with. First off, the architecture. How many layers are we talking about? You can pick. That's your choice. Do you want 10 layers? Do you only want two? What do you want, right? 
How many nodes go in each layer? The input is the size of your object that you're training, right? Like the feature set that in your training data set. But you can reduce that down to smaller sets, right? Just by picking different numbers of nodes, right? So how many? What do you do there? They typically do like things like binary numbers like 8, 16, 32, but you don't have to. You can pick whatever you want, right? What learning rate and weight do you use? There's seven different optimizers to choose from that pick different step size and what and how you update your weights, right? Which activation function do you use? We saw we showed you the sigmoid and the ReLU, but clearly there's a bunch of other ones, right? Uh, what about the batch size? If you do smaller batch sizes, it'll be faster, but it's more likely to memorize that data and give you high variance. If you go towards larger sizes, it's slower, but gives you less variance, right? Um, how many epochs do you use for training? As you're doing those learning curves, like when do you stop? And then what regularization do you use to prevent overfitting? Regularization is when you turn off nodes, um, and I'll show you an example of that, okay? First off, I think this is a good point to compare. There is some really, really intense deep learning going on up there. You can build some really, really beefy models. Take this one. This is LMNet. Um, and we love these people. Logan Ward and, and company over there at Northwestern, they did a really cool paper. It's called LMNet. It's basically a feature-free tool for predicting materials properties. You don't tell it anything about the composition-based feature vector, about the structure feature vector. You just do one hot encoding of what elements are present and you let it learn from lots of examples. And if you have a deep enough neural network and enough examples to learn from, then you can actually make predictions that are pretty good. Here they're showing you how the model performs. Here they're showing you learning curves, right? The loss function, in this case, mean average error as a function of epochs. They go out to 4,000 epochs, or at least somewhere around there, and look at how their depth, the layers of their depths change. They go from like depth five out to 24, so 24 layers. This allows you to learn highly nonlinear combinations of your inputs, right? And I can't remember how many nodes they had. I don't, I don't remember here, but the number of free parameters, the weights and biases that you can update total on these models is staggering. It's in the millions, right? It is a massive, massive model. And you get some sort of performance at the end of the day, which you know they compare to conventional learning. I just wanna show you this one. This shows you how LMNet performs, which again has millions of tunable parameters, and it gets some mean average error of about 50 MeVs. Now compare that with a classical model, random forest, I think it's even an unoptimized one, and you get a mean average error of 0 0.085. So definitely that difference is meaningful. Don't get me wrong, it's a, it's a meaningful difference. But I do want to point out that, you know, we don't have to use deep learning for every single problem. Look how simple it is to deploy that random forest algorithm what, 10 lines of code, <laughs> even including the featureizer, right? It's very simple to deploy this um, if all you want to do is to get a pretty good approximation. It's not going to be as good as this one maybe, but it's pretty good. So I think there's a trade-off to be had because training a random force model, first of all, implementing it and training it is way easier, way faster than some of these deep learning models. But deep learning models typically outperform if you've got enough data to train them on, right? All right. Now, what is, I mentioned dropout. What is dropout regularization? Well, regularization we've talked about, like remember in our linear models, things like ridge and lasso were types of linear models that penalized you for using more and more features. Well, there's something kind of akin to that in neural networks, and it's called dropout. Dropout basically says you have all these nodes that are connected, right, as you feed information forward in your ne network. What dropout does is it kills some of these nodes. So as these things are all being connected with one another, right, they're all being connected, this node never gets to pass information forward because we randomly dropped it out, right? So that's important to prevent you from memorizing your data too strictly, and it makes your model more generalizable. Typically, you see, take a look here. Here's your, you know, your error. This is your loss function plotted against, you know, a number of weight updates. And they see that without dropout, they only do to a certain point. But with dropout, they actually get better overall performance because you're making it more generalizable to your validation or test set. So dropout's easy to do. Here, here they're showing you how easy it is to implement it and whatever this is, um, that you can add it as a layer and it's a powerful tool to make it more generalizable. So I hope we covered the basics of neural networks. Um, we only talked about vanilla neural networks. We introduced this idea of what they're good for, kind of how they work. We talked about back propagation as the way how they can update your weights and your biases to minimize your output with respect to a cost function. But there's so much more that they can do. In our next video, we're going to dive into advanced deep learning. We'll talk specifically about convolutional neural networks.
and recurrent neural networks. And in our class after that, we'll probably talk about generative adversarial networks. We'll talk about transformers, variational autoencoders, lots of other you know, variations on this theme. So we'll see you in our next video. Okay, now that we've walked through the basic fundamental theory of a neural network, let's actually take a look at a notebook and see in code, what does it actually look like to implement one of these using PyTorch? This is following a tutorial from Aladdin Person. This is a great post on medium.com. So let's sort of walk through this. All right, so the example he does uses the MNIST dataset, which we've talked about a little bit in this series. That's the one where they took a bunch of handwritten digits, which have a label that somebody tried to write a seven, and we know it's a seven that they were trying to write. And we're gonna try and build a model that takes an input image of that and then predicts, well, classifies which number it's that the, the person wrote, okay? So here's how they, they go about doing this. First off, the libraries, the import that we need. Obviously, this is written in PyTorch, so we need Torch. Uh, from Torch, we're gonna grab .nn. That's the neural network module, right? That allows us to do linear models, convolutions, all sorts of things like that. We're gonna grab torch.optim. That's gonna allow us to do backpropagation, right? optimization using, well, different approaches. We've got nn.functional, that gives us functionals, right? Things like uh, the ReLU and things like that. Um, you've got torch.utils.data, from that we're gonna import data loader. Remember, neural networks don't train on the entire data set at once. We break it into chunks and we run it batch by batch through. And the data loader lets us do that into small chunks. Uh, we need to grab torch.vision.datasets. This is a really cool thing. I didn't realize that they had this. From Torch Vision, it actually has some of these classic datasets that you can just install right now and use them without having to sort of download a CSV file and then upload that into a pandas data frame and do all these transformations. It's just there, ready for you to use. And then uh, from torchvision.transforms, we need to grab transforms, which will allow us to do some of the operations that we need to do to transform our dataset during the neural network. Okay? so. We will grab the MNIST dataset. We're going to import Torch Vision. And from torch.utils data, we're going to import data loader. So here we go import torch vision.datasets as datasets. And then we're going to do import torch visions.transforms uh, as transforms. All right. So now we can go ahead and create them. First step is we're going to do is we're going to set up some of the things related to loading our data in. Like we can pick a batch size. It's efficient to do this as binary numbers raised to some number. So, you know, 8, 32, 64, things like that. We're going to do batch sizes of 64 samples at a time. So our training data will be datasets.mnist. Look how simple, just like that. You can, it already has some of these data sets ready to go. So we've got the MNIST data set. Now it has some details. It says, you know, root uh, data set. So meaning it's going to save that somewhere into a folder called data set. Train true, meaning we're going to use this to train on. Transform, yes, we want to transform this data to a tensor because neural networks do op their operations on tensors. And then download true, meaning if you don't have it, go ahead and download it. Uh, that's the train data set, right? Now we need to load it. So the train loader variable will be equal to the data loader, where we're using the data loader that we imported before, where we're telling it what the data is, the training data set, what the batch size is, the batch size of 64 that we just defined, and shuffle equals true. If you have sequential data where the order of the data matters, um, then you, you shouldn't be using a regular neural network. You should be using a recurrent neural network or an LSTM or something like that. Here it doesn't matter, and so it doesn't matter that we shuffle it. So let's go ahead and shuffle our data to make sure that it's randomized and that there's no bias in the order in which the data is present. Okay? And then for the test set, we do this basically the exact same. The only difference is that instead of having train set to equal true, we're going to say train is false, meaning this is our test set. Otherwise, it's the same steps that we did before. Okay? So now we have our data ready to go. Okay? And you can sort of read through this is nicely commented describing it but now we're getting to the model part of it since this is written in torch and they have that really awesome neural network module nn module we're going to create a class called nn and we're going to send to it our neural network dot module what these two lines of code do is it allows us to basically initialize this so that it, it inherits the same attributes that the neural network module has from pytorch which makes our life really easy, right? Um, then you've got this self.fc1. So in this class, we're going to say that there's a fully connected layer, fc1. That's our first fully connected layer. And it is equal to, again, we're going to the neural network module and we're going to put a linear module. So this is a regular feed forward, uh, linear, fully connected thing, right? Uh, and we can say what the input size is and what the output size is. So the input size will be whatever the size of our input dimensions are of our object, right? And then the output, we're going to say that it's going to 50 nodes, okay? Then we have a second fully connected layer, 
This fully connected layer, its input is 50, since it came from the one previous that sent 50 nodes. Now we're going to have 50 as the input. And then the output here is going to be the number of classes where we're trying to do our classification. So 10 digits, one through nine plus zero, right? So it's a really simple network. We're only doing two layers deep here, but you know, it's, you can see the steps here. It's pretty straightforward. And then because neural networks can do lots of things, it's actually necessary to describe what we're doing. Like, are you stepping backwards via backpropagation? Are you passing data forward during training? So we're going to define a function called forward where we send the neural network and data. Right? We're going to say that x is equal to, remember we're using f, that was the functionals that we brought in. So this is a ReLU function where we're going to apply the ReLU function to the output of that self dot fully connected layer one when you send data to it. So we're going to send the data through the first fully connected layer and then we're going to apply a ReLU uh, to it to squish that data back down to numbers between zero and one essentially. We then do, we say that x is now equal to the self fully connected layer two. And they're not adding a ReLU here because we're sending it straight to a classifier. So we don't need to squish it down anymore. We're just going to use the number as it comes out of that second layer directly and send it to our class, uh, number of classes, okay? So that's it. You built a layer, you said it has two layers, you told it what the sizes were, and you said, pass it forward and we told it what activation to use. There was no dropout. Um, it wasn't you know additional layers. We didn't do any of the more complicated things that can be done because this is just a really simple example of a simple fully connected network. Okay, so now we have our data. We now have built a model so we can start getting ready to train. Before we do that, we have to uh, figure out what device we're gonna do this on. If you have a CPU or a GPU. So to figure that out, there's an awesome torch tool. Again, we're gonna see that the device that you're using is equal to torch.device. And we're gonna set that equal to CUDA, meaning it's gonna run on your GPU card, your graphics card, if you have one. If torch.cuda is available, and if you don't have that, then we're gonna run on the CPU and it will be slower, but that's okay. The input size we need to define. Now these images from the MNIST dataset, if you open them up and look at them, they're all 28 pixel by 28 pixel images. So we're not doing a convolutional neural network or anything, this is just a regular one. So we're gonna take all 28 of those and we're just gonna flatten them into one big long array, which is 28 by 28, so 784. It's a one by 784, that's our input dimension. And the number of classes at the end is 10 because again, there's one through nine plus zero and we're gonna classify it into one of those categories. We also need to define a couple other things like our learning rate, which is related to how much of a step it takes based off of the gradient. We know how to calculate a gradient from earlier in this video, but now how big of a step do you take along that gradient? That's the learning rate, right? And then the number of epochs, Remember, as the data goes through and you train through all of your images in your training data set once, we call that a single epoch. But in neural networks, you don't train your data just once on the data. You run it through over and over again and you keep on doing back prop. And the number, and again, as you go through your data once, then we call that an epoch. So here we're saying train every image, train your neural network on every image at least three times. Well, not at least, but three times because we did three epochs of training. Okay. So we're pretty close to being able to do this. We're now going to initialize our model. We're gonna say that the model is the neural net class, NN class that we made earlier, where the input size is 784, the input size that we just defined. The number of classes is 10, the number of classes that we defined. And we're doing this on whatever device it got defined earlier, whether that was a GPU or a CPU, depending on what your system has. Uh, the criterion that we're gonna use, this is the loss function, right? When it actually uses backpropagation, it has to have some sort of loss function. And since we're doing a classification and not a regression problem, one popular loss function is cross entropy loss, which we're not going to talk about in this video, but it's not too different. Uh, it's essentially, you know, how often is it getting right compared to the other classes where it's getting it wrong? Anyways, more about that in probably a future video. The optimizer that we're going to use, we're going to use an atom optimizer. This is where the backpropagation is happening. It's a popular optimizer where you're, you're sending it the model parameters, which is essentially all the weights and biases in this neural network. And we're also sending it the learning rate so it knows how quickly to make changes based off of the things that it can change. Okay, that's a lot of work to get it ready, but we are now ready to train our first model. So check it out for epoch in range of number of epochs. So meaning it's gonna go epoch through epoch. There's, we're gonna train three times. This is the first training is what it's doing there. First off, it's gonna print and tell you which epoch it's training. And it's going to do, okay, four batch index and the tuple of data targets, which came out of train loader. So the train loader, it gives you target, 
and data, right? The target's what we're going to compare against. The data is what is going to go through our neural network. And then we're going to compare the output of the network with the target. And it keeps track of the batch ID as it does that. Okay. So for each one of those in the training loader, it's now going to, first off, send that data to the device, GPU or CPU, using this line of code. It's then going to send the targets to the device, GPU or CPU. Um, now there has to be one quick step here to change the shape of the input. The MNIST data wasn't quite ready to send through a neural network. We had to change the dimension. I think it was like a 1 by 28 by 28. We needed to take just one 28 by 28 layer of that. So we did a quick reshape of the data and now it's ready to send through. And so check it out. We can say that the scores is just equal to model where you send it data. The loss is equal to criterion where you send it the scores and the targets. So the scores is sort of like in other machine learning language, they would call that the Y predicted, meaning the target that you predicted. That's what they're calling scores here. And the loss then would be the some sort of criterion applied with what the known values were, the targets, and what your predicted values were, which they're calling the scores. It's just going to compare those two and, and use the um, cross entropy loss function to do so. Then you have to tell it the gradients. You say that the optimizer dot zero gradient, and then just like this, from your loss, whatever your loss was, we're now going to do dot backward, and that applies back propagation. Just as simple as that. You don't just have to do any of the math here. It's all done for uh, for you by this optimizer, which is pretty incredible. Okay, and then you just tell it, okay, now that you've uh, defined a backward step, go ahead and do it. So we're going to do optimizer dot step. So this actually steps backward through the algorithm and updates our weights and biases to improve our model based off of that first batch that it saw. Then it's going to go batch. If we go back up to the loop, it's going to go batch by batch through everything that's in our training loader, right? And when it's done with that and it's trained the entire data set once, then we finished our first epoch. It goes through the second epoch and the third epoch, updating your model as it goes. Okay, And that's it. Uh, so then when you're finally ready to do it, you can go ahead and actually implement your model here. So here they say, you know, they've got like a, a check accuracy function, which is going to evaluate how well the model does. Um, so you can sort of look through that. But the, the neural network part is done at this point. Like we've already trained our neural network. Now it's just a matter of scoring it and see how it does. And so the, the data is available there. So I hope that this was a relatively painless way to look at how, you know, what's going on under the hood of a neural network. Um, this is just one of many, many tutorials um, that are out there. We'll be putting one up on the GitHub for this page in a short period of time, and you'll be able to look through that as well. Okay, on to our next video where we will go from these so-called vanilla neural networks to more complicated ones, particularly ones that can deal with data that is either iterative in its, or it's sequential in nature or data that's scored in a matrix where the position of them matters. So more on that in our next video.